Hey folks, uh, these are our last uh, couple of classes. We'll have, well, we got three. The third one will be sort of just you folks talking about your 30 year vision for your languages, which um, I probably will not record because then we can just sort of talk amongst ourselves. It's been a great semester. Uh, today we're going to talk about master apprentice programs and potentially adult immersion programs uh, and a focus on I think what things can really be successful, what can really help, and what kinds of things might create some problems or what kind of problems you might run into. Uh, there was some talk uh, about some sharing some images and stuff. Like I like to make a bunch of images that really help me to figure out like how to get my thoughts in order when it comes to language revitalization and decolonization work. And so it kind of stems back to, uh, I, I like to draw a lot. And when I was in school, I would draw pictures and sometimes they were not even related to what I was listening to, but it helps me to sort of tune into things if I can keep the creative side of my brain kind of busy. But this would sometimes get me in trouble with teachers. and, and some teachers, I think there's sort of a, a bit of an old school way of thinking, which is you're supposed to be sitting still and listening and paying attention and focused. And I'm, I don't really operate that way and I don't really expect people to operate that way. And then, uh, but these are some things like coming back to this idea of developing entire educational structures for your language. Like there's a bunch of stuff you're gonna have to decide like, can people bring in fidget spinners and what do you do with folks who need who have a hard time sitting still and what do you do with folks who are more visual learners and just on and on so a whole bunch of stuff but anyways as we are sort of digesting a bunch of concepts in primarily was in the program in hawaii but also like just going to different language conferences and then continuing to teach courses like this and to just keep thinking about what it takes like I draw a lot of pictures because those pictures, I think, help me to sort of develop my own personal framework and set of beliefs when it comes to um, creating language movements. And so if you you folks are here and like if, if people want to use this stuff and it helps them with their language work, use this stuff. Like um, I really I just have a lot of fun trying to create this stuff. Uh, and then the maddening part is trying to sort of turn these ideas and these visions into realities and so that's kind of the stuff that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days but i put a link into the chat that's a google folder with just a bunch of stuff like um that i use uh, a lot of them went into my dissertation then i think i even have one other folder perhaps Anyways, um, just use that one. I, I think it's called Spheres of Language Revitalization was the one that we were, uh, Salakthuna and I were talking about just in terms of like how this image might kind of represent some of the work that we're talking about. And we'll take a quick look at that. Then we'll turn it over to our folks for um, talking about master apprentice programs. Uh, and I'll have a few documents to share with you folks based on some work I did with folks in Yakutat. So again, sort of coming back to this thing, uh, this is a, a big part of how I think language revitalization work uh, can sort of function. So some of our focus is on fluency, which is just making the language more familiar with an individual. Like how likely is someone to be able to say what they wanna say and to understand what they hear? Uh, normalization is making the language familiar with the landscape. So as people walk around on your land, especially, do they see it? Do they hear it? Is it around them? Because if it's unusual, then it, they have to sort of shift their mind frame in order to go into the language. And similar to that is you can also have the language normalized. Th those are very similar things. Like if your fluency is high, but you don't hear the language very often, you sort of, when you, once you hear it, you've got to sort of shift your, your whole mentality. But if you're around it all the time, then that just, you're more receptive. You're, you're sort of like, the receptors are just always on. 
the vernacular, uh, which Pila Wilson or Dr. William Wilson, if you want to cite him, he calls it re-vernacularization. And vernacular means, is this what people use to communicate? So that's a really important concept because folks might become more fluent in the language, but if they're not using it as the language of communication, then it gets stuck into these sort of domains and the language, you just end up with this sort of classroom version of the language. And then reclamation um, is another part of that, which is taking the language into social spheres. So uh, like there's a whole bunch of examples we've talked about all semester with this stuff, but it's basically, can you cut fish in the language? Can you make drums in the language? Can you uh, buy gas in the language? Can you make trades in the language? Can you correct someone's behavior in the language? And so it, it's all about sort of figuring out how to do a particular thing which is usually a physical or social space and then taking it back for the language. And for me, all this stuff is driven by courage and determination so that you're, you're going to make the bold move. You're also going to be the one who keeps people in the language. You're going to be guided by your ancestors so that you're not always just translating the English world. You're going to have love for yourself and for your people so that you can do this stuff and not be unkind with your own people and with the, the ones who are trying to do this stuff. And then you're going to act with kindness and humility. And so for me, those are things that mostly come from elders that I worked with a lot who I noticed not everybody acted like they did, which was to always really be kind. And, you know, sometimes everybody gets a little harsh, but um, yes, yeah, so I just want to share that with you folks. And then there's some explanations in, um, in my dissertation if you want to see it uh, and this is something that I think is pretty foundational to the work that I try to do. Any thoughts on that? Could you send out your dissertation? I just did a quick search and I'm not locating it. Yeah I'll put that in the chat now. It might get published uh, but I gotta it's, it got reviewed and I got to look at the reviews. Um, I'm not that excited about what the reviews are going to say. Uh, however, you know, that's the academic process. I also had a book of poetry that was reviewed recently and those reviews were horrible and racist. And so, um, but this is hopefully a better crew that's sort of looking at it. But peer review is really interesting to me in academics. It's really frustrating sometimes to me because Sometimes you want to shift the way things are, but if you want to shift the way things are, you need to publish. And if you need to publish, you have to have people review it who are in the system. And sometimes it's sort of like, but I understand because, you know, there, there should be checks and balances and processes in place to make sure that everybody's doing proper academic work. But um, there, and there's a whole bunch of directions that this stuff can go to, like uh, linguistics and language revitalization and stuff. So. Anyways, let's talk about the Master Apprentice program. You folks want to take it over from here, and then I'll jump in when, you, when you're done. Sure, let me get my file up on screen here. Dr. Juice, are you ready? Um. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? I need to move back in my slide presentation. Not yet. Can you see the screen? We're not seeing okay. it. Okay. You're not seeing it yet? No. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> okay. I can minimize you all too. Yeah, yeah. But Dr. And I worked together on a previous um, presentation and um, 
we decided we'd like to work together on another presentation. Um, I chose this, um, this topic because it's something that I would like to work next in helping create opportunities for in my um, home region. And Dr. Juice, um, further in the presentation, will talk about some of his personal interest in this topic as well. Uh, so um, here we go. First of all, um, Dr. Juice, I don't remember. Were you doing? You were doing this one here, weren't you? You're starting off. Um, yeah. Uh, this so. Uh, Reasons uh, on why create a master apprenticeship program. Um, first of all, master apprenticeship programs are not new. They're as old as our languages, and our languages connect us to our worldview. Um, and we learn more about our customs, inherent values, and respect. It's a great tool to reverse language loss um, because you do produce uh, more speakers. And then the goal is for those um, new speakers um, to become masters and have apprentices and um, keep the wheel turning on the master apprenticeship program. So you're constantly uh, producing more speakers. Teaches authentic pronunciation to apprentices. Um, apprentice is able to start using language in the home and throughout the day, normalizing their language in natural settings. And a bond between elder and apprentice is created and maintained. So, um... A, a large um, a large part of the credit for master apprenticeship program of kind of launching in language revitalization efforts is due to Leanne Hinton's work and she's written the handbook on this um, strategy or this program. Um, so that's a picture of Leanne Hinton there. Later on when Ducks Juice is talking, I'm going to drop a um, link into the chat that has a video of Leanne Hinton presenting about master, apprentice pro master apprenticeship programs so that if any of you wanted to watch this video later on, you can. Um, but basically the way a master apprenticeship program works is a fluent speaker is paired with learners um, that are committed and patient um, learners. And they are, they've demonstrated an interest and commitment to learning the language. Master apprentice, masters, it's important that masters are well compensated for their time. That hasn't always been the case in language work and in a master apprenticeship, we need to recognize that, that equity. And the master apprenticeship program works by keeping people in the target language. And some master apprenticeship programs um, are fledgling and they need to start off with a little bit of time in the target language and gradually built up, but the goal is to stay entirely in the target language. And the, um, the domains of, of language that are used for this work are um, culturally engage, engaging topics, as well as um, daily um, tasks and conversations um, for, for kind of that growth and work area for the master and the apprentices. And it's important that the apprentice works um, works a, works ahead in, a, in of these sessions and uh, compiles the vocabulary and their phrases that um, they're going to be focusing on, so that that effort is put in ahead of time. Uh, one of the points we also wanted to highlight is if there are multiple master apprentice um, pairings or um, groups going on, that gathering all of them together regularly um, would be uh, an asset. It provides elders a chance to speak freely with one another in front of the apprentices, and it allows the apprentices to engage with one another, listen, and record el elders engaged in conversation. And then Ducks Juice is going to talk about the levels of um, progression for each year in a typical three-year master apprenticeship. Oh, uh, um, so um, in the first year, um, 
The apprentice will learn words, commands, simple sentences, learn a fair amount of vocabulary, able to greet and introduce themselves, able to engage in basic conversation, can make a short speech and tell a short story. And in the second year, understands most of what the mentor says, able to talk briefly about most subjects, able to speak in simple sentences without mistakes, able to engage in longer conversations. And um, in the third and final year, so at the end of the third year, um, you're expected to be able to speak at length, tell stories, give speeches on different topics, um, and develop plans for teaching others. And um, the apprentice, once the apprentice starts uh, teaching others, uh, they themselves are moving towards uh, being a master. And this is all based on um, if the uh, apprentices are meeting with their master like um, four, hours a, four hours a day, five days a week. So these next two slides, we're gonna come back to later if we have time, slides eight and nine, but basically these are some tips and tips for overcoming challenges and some ideas for activities. Um, I think we're just gonna move on to um, some of the uh, larger topics um, that interested um, duck juice in particular. So duck juice. Oh, uh, okay. Um... Some of us can really relate to this by the uh, significant loss of our elders. Um, for Hot Kill, our last speaker is Aunt Dolores Churchill of Ketchikan, and she's in her 90s. Um, in my hometown of Craig, there hasn't been a fluent elder speaker since 1983. So it's um, been decades since we had a fluent speaker. I, I remember growing up and listening to my non um, uh, speak with a couple other high de elders in Craig. Um, and it was wonderful listening to them converse in hot kill. Um, it's going to be a very, very long, um, difficult road to get back to that point, but uh, it's not that it's impossible. Um, uh, especially if you, if uh, with this master apprentice program, um, if uh, the apprentices are genuinely interested and put forth the work and um, committed to becoming speakers themselves, if we keep producing uh, speakers, then it is possible again to hear um, Hod Kill. Um, in the conversational format once again in Craig, even though it's been decades. So this topic is of particular in interest to me as I'm going to be moving back to my hometown to teach Hod Kill. And I am going to have, uh, I'm not going to have a mentor our master or an elder um, uh, to go and meet with and learn more. So what if 
there are no fluent elders left in your hometown. Um, but perhaps there's an advanced speaker who is comfortable with teaching. Okay, so that would be the next option. Um, so um, seek out masters who have time available. Um, that's another problem. Um, uh, sometimes we have advanced speakers and intermediate speakers um, that we can learn from, but they have no time in their schedule. They're too busy already. Um, that is a, another big hurdle to overcome. So if no advanced speakers have time, wait for intermediate speakers to level up to advance and see if they are willing to mentor. And uh, last case scenario, it may be that you will be the one who has to level up to like an advanced level to be the master in the master uh, apprenticeship program. Um, the next couple of slides are two recently um, announced master apprenticeship programs that um, we were able to locate. And there are two programs that are um, being offered now as opportunities for people through the First People's Cultural Council. And because there are two different master apprenticeship programs, I wanted to um, share the two differences with the group here and um, and maybe see what some of your thoughts are on these. So the first program that the First People's Cultural Council in British Columbia is offering their applications are actually open now for this is um, an intensive and it's for people who are interested in being a language educator and they are possibly also our parents or soon to be parents. So there's that interest in um, the next generation and their purpose in um, uh, wanting to become uh, a, a part of this program. And in this particular program, they are focusing on people between the ages of 16 to 50 who have a plan to actively um, work on passing on the language. And it's an intensive program. It's nine months with 300 hours of immersion with a fluent speaker. And then interestingly, there's also another program that First People's Cultural Council is um, providing an opportunity for uh, master apprenticing and it's the connect master apprentice connections program and it's for people who have some language knowledge or who are silent speakers and this program seeks to strengthen one's connection to their language and it allows the apprentice to complete the program at a much more relaxed pace without some of the reporting requirements and um, and this one is six months with a hundred hours And then knowing that um, this work is uh, work that you oftentimes need to take care of one another and take care of yourself while you do it, we just wanted to um, uh, share some reminders of how to forge, um, how to keep going forward when this work becomes tough or discouraging, as it sometimes does. And uh, we've got the tips there shared on the screen. Remember that you are enough and be proud of yourself. Call on your ancestors when you need help. Ground yourself through your ancestors and through remembering that you're enough. Take deep breaths. Always remember that your work is important and priceless, and we deserve to have our languages um, reclaimed. And then, um, if you, uh, Hune, I don't know how we're doing for time. I know you wanted to compress some topics, and so. Um, uh, we can go to thoughts and questions, or we can go back to some of the activities that Duck Juice has um, compiled that could go within a master apprenticeship program. Oh, it would be great to see those activities. Okay. All right. Duck Juice, you had <clears throat> listed in your research some strategies for overcoming challenges. Oh, uh, um. 
<clears throat> so um, once the uh, um, master apprenticeship program um, takes off, um, you want as many um, tools at your disposal available uh, that you could use to um, help stay away from English. And, um, and uh, um, at first you may have to do um, five minute immersions in the target language and, and then build on that. Turn that into 10 minutes in the target language and so on and so on until you're virtually are all in a uh, target language. So you could use gesture, mind, facial expressions when communicating, use props and photos, uh, apprentices should listen intently to build pronunciation and they say um, not to take notes. Um, I noticed that when um, I'm listening to elders speaking on audio and I and if I'm taking notes, the notes that I'm taking um, consume so much time that I miss out on pronunciation and words. Um, so they emphasize not to take notes, um, but instead being um, an active learner and um, what's better than notes is if you record the sessions um, uh, with audio or video or preferably both. If you have both, then you could see um, the elder or the speaker, how they use uh, their mouth and their throat when they speak. And activities and tips. Uh, you could act out um, heritage stories with puppets. Um, you could use TPR, Total Physical Response Method, uh, for learning commands, body parts, and you could use gestures and actions as well. Uh, picture books are great. They say if you don't have any, you don't have to spend a lot of money. You could um, go to the library and check out picture books. And that is a great way of learning vocabulary. You could use index cards for um, task-based learning. Um, the cards are put face down and the master and apprentice take turns picking up a card and they tell their partner what to do without using any English. How uh, select an uh, So we just want to know if anyone has any thoughts, questions, feedback. That was fabulous. Anybody got any thoughts or questions? I got a few things, but I'll hold off. When you guys were talking to First Peoples Cultural Council, um, did you guys hear anything? Oh, yeah. Let me. You, are, I, you were cutting up. Did you want to link to that? Oh, no. I was checking it out. And um, it's only in BC. Huh? It's not one for Alaska. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I, I neglected to put the link in the chat for um, the video of Leanne Hinton presenting on Master Apprentice, so I'll do that now.
Awesome. Yes. So I have a quick question. This is Sani. First, it was beautiful. I love your presentation. I strive to be as good as that someday. <laughs> but I, my question is, when you talk about the tasks for the task-based activities, so you would create these cards for all these different scenarios, or you would just, would that would be like a game, like kind of mixed up and you just kind of pull one from the deck, or do you have you know, the one for the table, the one for while you're fishing, the one while, you know, task-based. So just wanted clarification on that. Ganeshish, thank you. Well, Asani, um, so um, uh, you write up different commands on the flashcards, um, like, uh, Go hang up your coat or... Good evening, everybody. Hi. So, my... in the link. Go ahead. So, um, go get me a cup of coffee, find my phone, um, different commands like that. Um, one of them is, um, like, give me a dollar, and then you have to... <laughs> Uh, give them a dollar and you do it all um, in the language. Um, so uh, to me, it, it it's task based, but it sounds it sounds fun, like a fun way to learn. And you can laugh with each other, you know, and um, enjoy it. That's the way learning should be, should be fun. I had a quick question and it might be more towards um, Clune, but I know SHI had a master apprenticeship program and um, I, I, I know a few folks that went through, but I didn't really talk to them about the whole process, but um, I was wondering how that went and how like the end result or any process or anything like that. Cause I think, I think this cohort is if I believe, if I'm correct, it's replacing the master apprenticeship program, or is it just a different grant? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I, I think we had sort of decided to move on from a master apprentice model, just particularly where we are at. Although I do think it could work. Uh, I think it can work. Uh, some of the problems that I think that were run into was there was more apprentices than masters and so people were sort of grouping up with some of the the masters and then the the program i saw in yakutat was pretty successful um but then the, there there's a number of different sort of things that that i would think about and one is just sort of like just getting the right folks which is always so hard to do and it's always i think one of the hardest parts is like when you have to say okay, you might not be the right person for this. And that's a very difficult thing to do because the languages are severely endangered. And so you're also, and, and then you're also sort of like, well, who are you to say who's the right folks to do this? Um, but in some cases, if the, the number one issue is if folks will not just switch over to using the language. And so, from my perspective, I think what has to happen is an awful lot of preparation work and, and really driving into the, the mind of the elder, of the master. It doesn't matter if they don't understand you. You have to have faith that they will. And then you just keep communicating and, and you find things that you already sort of know about. Like I know you were talking about pictures and stuff like that. Like one of the things that uh, Dr. Hinton talks about is bringing in, especially the communities are usually fairly small. So bringing in family photo albums and just looking through it and using the language because you already usually know most of the people that are in there. Although, you know, certainly you could have families that aren't terribly connected, but I think some of those things really help so that, and then we would, um, we would talk our teams through and say, talk on the phone, like do, do like a good half hour to an hour on the phone, planning the session so that everything can be sort of 
and do it in English. So if we're on the phone, we can use English, right? So let's say um, I'm the apprentice, you're the master. So we can use English. So I'll call you up, I'll say, okay, so I thought today we'd talk about how the weather changes in the winter and how we have to start dressing differently and things we think about when we're going for short trips and long trips. And then I, I was gonna bring a picture of my grandparents and they were friends with your uncle or, or whatever. And I thought we'd look through these old photo albums and just sort of talk about them. That way you sort of, you, you, you're both are doing a little bit of preparation work. And for your speaker, I think that's really important. Um, because they kind of got to get into a mindset of, of what they're going to talk to you about. Then for the learner, for the apprentice, they have to, I think, understand, record every session and listen to it again, because you cannot stop the speaker to say, what, what was that? Could you say that part again? I, I didn't catch that. I didn't catch, you know, be, I mean, to some extent, sometimes you can, like if you're in the language to do a little bit of that stuff. But you don't want to always stop the session to say like i need to understand everything before we do the next thing because i think that's going to stunt the whole process because a lot of what we're trying to do here is very it, it's extremely challenging because you might have one or two speakers left you might have 10 or 20. You, maybe you get even if you got a thousand speakers if your language has not been actively producing speakers everything has to shift and so because of that like this process is, i think it's very delicate um, because the other thing that can happen is you could be sort of trying to improve the process but you end up sort of over policing it and then everybody gets too nervous and then there's like well we gotta be like super amazing in the language and we can't do that all the time so i guess we're failing so there's it seems like there's always this sort of fear of, of failure as well. But I do think that it has really in, increased, you know, a, one of your goals for a master apprentice program, I think is to try and get a handful of highly fluent second language learners. And, and the idea is like, you've got this limited amount of time to do it with the, the speakers that you have. So that means you, you have to start changing the end so that they will become the future masters of other apprentices even if you know here's the thing if you if you're doing this work you'll never be ready and and things will never be ready for you 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 just have to go with what you have and then you continually go with what you have and then someday maybe there'll be some group that has it all ready for them and you could just say talk to them in your language about how you walked uphill both directions in the snow and how difficult it was when you had to learn. But that's because you're going to build this whole thing. But I think another thing that's probably needed is a structured learning environment in addition to the master apprentice program. The, the primary reason for that is because the language is usually not spoken in very many places. So the, the other thing is you can go in and you learn and these these are your your times of language use so that you're understanding like the cadence of the language, the rhythm, the topics, the things that folks talk about, the types of words, you know? So like some of the work you can do as an apprentice is not just to keep listening to it over and over again, but start to do an analysis. Say, what are the verbs that they're using most often? And then these are the ones we've got to start teaching to other folks. And what are some of the concepts that they keep coming back to? And so those are some things that, uh, that I think about. And I also want to give, uh, you folks did it already, but I want to give a lot of credit to Leanne Hinton who came up and visited with us. And then I got a chance to go visit with her when I was invited down to talk at UCLA Berkeley. Um, and I kind of, I want us to think about this again. I, I think we looked at this before. So, Jinkasi, uh, you have a, thoughts or a question. Uh, you had just mentioned that the master apprentice program could be done through uh, a handful of advanced speakers. Is that something like the former master apprenticeship program uh, students, like who are the apprenticeships, could be a possible pair for 
for us. And I'm asking because I've met with Nicole and they've discussed um, setting us up with master apprenticeships. But of course, with limited elders, we we're wondering like how, who we could work with in our community. Um, so is that a possibility? Um, yeah. Or, I, or I, I do think that that's going to have to happen uh, because similar to other languages, we, we've got I mean, I think folks that you can really talk to a lot, like some of them, they're already working in the schools. There's a couple in Tesla and there's a couple in Kluckwan who are very elderly, a couple in Sitka who are very elderly, a couple maybe in Cake, a couple in Huna. And so it's it becomes a process, a, sort of a process of saying, like, we might not have access to that anymore. Like we did 10 years ago and we especially did 20 years ago. Um, so I do think the master apprentice program can sort of give way to more of an adult immersion program. And, and so maybe the terminology has to change or, or maybe we need to find some other term because the other thing is I could take anybody from uh, the highest level of Tlingit that we're teaching right now and I could take people who've taken that class you know, four or five times and say, okay, you're the master now. And they are probably say, Hell no, I'm I'm not. I'm just learning. I'm just and so I think sort of like giving it a new title. It's sort of like when you start calling people like a master artist or a master weaver, so it's like Nani Delora, she says, I'm not a master, I'm just learning. I'm like, okay. Right. So, you know, so maybe there's a way to sort of create a new title that's somewhere in between the the what the adult immersion program is and what the master apprentice program is. And so maybe it's um, because really you have an advanced second language learner who's going to be teaming up with, and, and I think it's going to have to be like this sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of our own pyramid scheme. So like you, you do, you're going to have folks who are very high and then you have other folks who are a little bit below them and folks who are a little bit below them. And so the idea is they're all talking and then some of those questions or things that they're running into start going up the ladder. And then when we do have time to spend with our elders who are speakers, like we can, st and we can start sending questions and, and, and stuff through folks who are in contact with them. So that, and especially with, with COVID, I, I think it, it also just kind of ruined everything that we had going. Like to be, to be honest, we had a language nest and we did have master apprentice programs going in, in a variety of different ways, uh, whether they're sort of formal or not. So. I do think it's time to sort of take it to the next phase, which is sort of figuring out. So like basically a master apprentice program historically has been, it works best in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. Once you start introducing three people, four people, five people, I think it gets really difficult. And by that, I mean, you have a master speaker and they have a single apprentice. If, if you have a master speaker with two or three of them, I think it, it just increases the likelihood that everyone will switch to English because people are at different levels and then someone's going to always sort of feel a little bit left out. And then the other group's going to sort of slow everything down so that they don't feel left out. And so I do think historically it, it should be a one-on-one. -on -one. That's the way I've seen it be effective. Uh, but also like every, we've been doing this for over a decade and there's always been a shortage of, of master speakers. Okay, well, uh, back to California. So I was thinking of this because like, this is where this concept sort of starts. And again, like, I, I really like what you folks says, like this, people do this forever. You just, you learn at the feet of your grandparents. Like that's, that's what you do. Uh, but there was this massive disjuncture. And, and so as sort of languages are, are broken, the, the chain has, has been broken a lot of places and some languages it hasn't. So that's another big question you ask is like, do you have, uh, intergenerational transmission that's unbroken in, in Hawaii they do like they, they they you have to look at Ni'ihau and, and places like that but there are places where folks didn't stop speaking to kids and didn't stop raising people in the language and Navajo has an unbroken chain and, and I think you pick and probably you know but for some languages that there, there is this broken there's like a generation or maybe even two that didn't get to learn that didn't have a chance to use the language. And so then you've got some different, you've got a different sort of approach.
But just for perspective, um, Alaska is about 660,000 square miles, according to what I just Googled. And there were 23 known languages at the time of contact. Okay, so California is about 160,000 square miles. So about almost one sixth the size of Alaska with 36 languages at the time of contact. So way more languages per square mile, right? So like a very dense, this was the densest linguistic area in North America. And so every single one of these languages is probably extremely endangered or perhaps like has no speakers left. I was here in uh, Coast Miwok territory and somebody stood up and they started talking and um well, let me i'm going to take the long way to get here i was walking along i was at this artist retreat at this wonderful place right up across the golden gate bridge from san francisco and um we were there and i was walking along and i saw i noticed a bunch of fish just kind of on the ground these little fish like a sardine sized fish and i was like What's going on because i could see the ocean but it was about a mile away so i was like what what are these fish doing here and i saw somebody dumping a cooler so i thought oh yeah they're dumping uh dumping their baits maybe and this was the bait they were fishing but then as i walked around i just started seeing them everywhere and i realized okay there are fish on the land about a mile up from the ocean so my question to you all is how did that happen Little fish on the land. How'd they get there? And they're, they're all over the place, right? And so then I saw they had these kind of heron looking birds. I can't remember what they're called. Egrets or something? It was it on the land by the river or? There was the ocean, right? So I could see the bay, but we were about at least a mile. I mean, it was a, it was a ways. We were ways up. We were upland from it. Did the tide come in and out really quickly? The tide, we were a mile away from the tide. Was, Is it, uh, it was some far. beaches are really shallow. I don't know. Right? Yeah, that, that's how I was trying to think of it. And I saw these birds that would hang out in the trees. I was like, did these birds bring all these? That's a lot of fish. And they were all over the place. Not like, not like the whole land was covered, but it was obviously a thing. It wasn't just like a few here and there. And so, I didn't know. So then we had this dinner later and this guy stands up and he starts talking and I was at this artist retreat, right? So it's like, it was all English and it was all, it, it was primarily white and there's a few people of color, you know, there's, there's a few black artists. And then there was, there was me as the only indigenous Native American artist who was there. And, uh, when I was listening to this person stand up and talk, I was thinking, I remember thinking, why can't I understand what they're saying? <laughs> then I realized, oh, they're speaking another language. Okay, hold on. I, I, I think I figured it, but it took me a second to like figure out what was going on because it didn't seem like the type of environment where I'd be hearing other languages. And then when he got done, he said he was Miwok and he was speaking in his language. And he shared two things. One is the answer to the fish question, which was this. When his grandpa was, uh, he said, I heard you folks were talking about like these fish. And when my grandpa was young, there was this event that he witnessed where there was something that goes on where there's some kind of vortex and the water gets evaporated very fast up into the clouds and actually pulls fish out of the ocean. And then it rains the fish down onto the land. And I thought, okay, check that off my list of things I didn't know could happen. And then he said, uh, we're Miwok peoples, but we, we learned how to blend in because in California, people used to just kill Native Americans like crazy. And so my family, it just became our way of life to pass as either white or Mexican because then people might leave you alone. So I want to just sort of put this in, in, in sort of in the context of um, the Master Apprentice program. And then I also want to show, uh, I got to take a picture with Leanne. She was, I got a tour 
a short tour of the area and she's talking about some languages that she worked in in the area and, and we talked a lot about the history of of what they did and how they did it and, and what she was involved in and she came up and she spent a lot of time with us talking about master apprentice programs and talking about our vision of having language nests and she was very nice very helpful uh, a wonderful person like so like sometimes you bring people in to help you and they're, they're just kind of they just you get this feeling like they just kind of take over but i felt like she was just there to observe and then she gave feedback and the feedback was very kind and i think very very helpful so this happened right before we launched the master apprentice program in yakutat and i want to share a few things with you folks let's see where do i want to start so maybe i'll start here uh, let me this a little bigger so we started trying to figure out like what could we do with the master apprentice program and so one of the things that we did is we we tried to get the apprentices to do a lot of the work so we wanted them to fill out a, a, a form saying like what are your goals for this month like take it one month at a time set some goals and then either accomplish them or make them running goals like we're like if it takes a more than a month, it takes two or three, that's fine. But so some of the things, like here's some sample things, like I want to learn how to cook and I want to learn how to do all the meal preparation and everything all in the language. So I could say, you know, some of this is like pour water, put this much in, cut this, make it like that, turn that up to this temperature. And, you know, a lot of the stuff, some of the stuff you might have to figure out how to say. So with the master apprentice program too, you have to give them a lot of assistance and I think authority to say, if there's not a way to say it, make a way to say it. Like, you know, how are you gonna say it's set the oven to 350 degrees or, you know, parboil this or, or whatever. You're gonna have to sort of just sort of figure out a, bun a bunch of this stuff. Uh, learn about housework, such as doing laundry, washing the dishes, cleaning, fishing and hunting. So um, say prayers. Talk about your family, place names, visit some places that are important, and then learn a new skill, uh, which is always kind of difficult. But I, I think you could do it through a whole series of sessions. Um, I do think you're going to have to start with stuff that both people already know how to do. Like just trying to learn something new and learn the language at the same time is really difficult. So for example, so then we would sort of take this list of goals and then they would blow up this thing for getting prepared. So if we're going to talk about fishing and how to fish in the language uh, for preparation, they're going to find photos of different fish that are in the area. What kind of fish do you catch? You catch king salmon, pink salmon, snapper, halibut, flounder, whatever. Get all the fish that you can find and get pictures of them. Uh, and then you could start with some things like What's the name of these fish? And then you could try and move into uh, how are these fish prepared? And do you know any stories about these fish? And this is something where for a whole lot of this, like, how do you say this? And how do you say that? That's what the phone calls are for. Okay, so I'm going to ask you how to cook this fish. So how do I say, how do you cook this fish? And then they'll, they'll tell you that way, you know which phrase to ask to sort of prompt the conversation to go. Because I think one of the bottom lines is they are unnatural conversations because they haven't existed for a long time. You know, not that they haven't existed, but uh, they've been in these very small pockets. So you're going to have to sort of figure out how to do that. And then go find a whole bunch of fishing gear, like bring the stuff, bring the, the hooks and the whatever you're using, the pole. So you can sort of start talking about stuff and, and going through and then some of this stuff is also going to be figuring out where the language might have some blank spots like oh we don't know how to talk about tying a hook on to a line like we're going to have to figure out how to talk about that and then uh going and, and digging in the dictionary and finding a whole bunch of fishing verbs like if it's thing it we got 20 different verbs because there's 20 different ways fishing with a net fishing with a dip net fishing with a pole fishing with a gaff hook and so then they would go through and just sort of list out their goals, their planning, their preparation. Uh, and I think these are all repeating the same thing. 
So then they do their goals, and then we also had them do, uh, let's see what I'm looking for now. So then they would do a monthly report. So the monthly report, hold on, let me get rid of this. Try to make this look bigger. And this, this program isn't running anymore, but if you folks are doing Master Apprentice programs, like I can I can share these with you folks as templates. Just reach out and let me know if, if you're interested in them. So some of the things is, is writing down the date, who was there, how much time was spent together, and how much of that time was in the language. And this is something I think people do have a hard time with. Because let's say, you know, we were together for two hours, uh, and so maybe we'll say two hours. And then when we really sat down and thought about it, like maybe we spent 20 minutes in the language. So some of the things here is really trying to get folks to be honest about this stuff. And at one point I suggested like just bring a stopwatch and just hit it when you're in the language and then hit it again when you switch to English. And then it's a lot of manual stuff. And then I think one of one of the, the mentors got really upset at that idea. But I was saying, I was like, nobody's trying to sort of get anybody into trouble, but I want us to be honest here so that we can, and to sort of say, okay, like, let's say we get together for one hour and we did five minutes. So instead of like feeling like you're defeated, like use this as a benchmark. Just saying, okay, we've got to do at least five minutes every hour. And then can we do 10? Can we do 15? Can we do 20? And on the other side of this, for the folks, if there are folks who are managing this program, if they can get to 25% of their time in the language, have a celebration. Give them some awesome presents. Give them some money. Do, do something great for them. If they can get to half the time, three-quarter of the time, full time. Like, really acknowledge the growth here. But so one is being honest about this stuff, because if if we're just hanging out and speaking English, but then I say we did 45 minutes, then it really hurts the whole program. But you don't want to be policing people, but I think using this as a way to measure success, like this is what success is, is increasing that time. Like that I think is the number one sort of factor in, in sort of determining whether you're successful or not. So then they could list what the goal was then they could list the activities. So we did, we got photos of fish, and we got fishing equipment, and we, we looked at different types of boats and different places to fish, and then what was successful. So when we we're talking about fish, like we were naming them and talking about them. Um, and then you might have like, none of us could understand. They were talking us to stuff and then we, we just couldn't understand what they were saying. So this is where I think you're usually gonna need, I think, someone who's a bridge between the two who could come and say well let me listen to the audio what part didn't you understand and then listen to it and say okay here's here's the thing they're talking about this stuff and let me show you this verb and how it works and so i i do believe a lot of these programs could really benefit by having a a third like that there's the mentor and the apprentice and then there's the teacher who comes in i think at times and and just assist with some things and then they they sort of list out the next steps, and so that was, those were the things that we had, and um, I think it did really help. So, uh, yeah, I can send these to Alan, um, and I could send these, uh, I can send these to to everybody, and so, but just also trying to figure out like how are these going to be, you know, I I think the maybe a Google form these days, because then people could just sort of sign on and, and like, because you want to have processes that help you track where you're at, but the more processes you have, the more people are going to fall behind on stuff. And then you have to figure out a whole bunch of junk, but also like people are getting paid. And so for the ment for the mentor, they should be getting the most money and they should be doing the least administrative work. And then for the apprentice, like they should be getting good money, but they should also be re responsible for the reporting. Yvonne? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in that um, one dynamic sometimes is that you, you might not live in the same place as your master <laughs> or your, your, your the mentor. And I guess a, a hybrid approach that I think just 
organically has emerged for me anyways, is if I only get limited time a couple of times a year, perhaps with a mentor that I'm learning from, we just stay in language the entire time. I'm understanding, well, when we first started, you know, I would say maybe 10% of what was being said. And now maybe I've increased a few percentage points, you know, from there. Um, but everything would be, and it, sometimes this was hours in the language of just stories and history or context. And, and the mentor was really guiding because the mentor was wanting to make sure that all this language and stories was documented and recorded. And then the work in between for me is transcribing then all of that. So I'm practicing writing the language, listening to it. And then exactly as you said, I'd bring in other first language speakers, some of them who just had a really high comprehension. They might not be able to speak at that high of a level as the men, as the master, but they can comprehend everything. And so they would help me to understand pieces that I did not understand what was being said. Um, and then that would give me more things to have to study. The other piece, I guess, for, for us is that we don't have a dictionary to go to, to like look up all of those verbs for fishing. <laughs> so there's, there's literally almost no place to go to find out what those verbs are. Um, you know, you might be able to dig around a little bit and come up with one word in isolation, and then you'd have to figure out, you know, what the stem is and then root and hope that you're conjugating it out to create a verb paradigm for it. Um, but then you have to go back to the master or to another speaker for some speaker to kind of validate your verb paradigm that you've built off of the one word that you heard um, sort of exercise. But I think that um, what I've found is that, yes, having that third person, like you said, or fourth person is super helpful to kind of lift some of the burden off of the, the, the master mentor speaker um, and for a second language learner to get that added assistance. And even better if you have somebody you can lean on if you're wanting to become literate who could also guide you to make sure you're spelling everything accurately, you know, based on what it is that you're hearing um, from the from the speaker as well. Um, so anyways, but I, I'm excited about Doyon Foundation doing a master apprenticeship program that they're going to launch next year and interested to see how that, how they choose to structure it. Um, but I also like what you were saying about kind of this hybrid with adult immersion and adult immersion is something that I'm pretty excited about, about thinking through how do you take people, especially from a beginner or early intermediate stage, more to a proficient level of speaking in a context where they're being, where they're learning the language and grammar and literacy while they're also getting multiple hours of immersion time daily. So it kind of compounds. And that's essentially what I do when I'm back home in my village, which unfortunately I'm not there enough, but when I'm there, I speak with as many people as I possibly can in the language because pretty much everyone over 60 can speak fluently. And then at night, I'm just trying to digest and research and write down and study and so that I'm a little bit more prepared the next day for just being out in, around the village. And so anyways, I think that that that's why I'm my, my mind is also kind of there around thinking about what's this intersection of maybe master apprenticeship with adult immersion. Yeah, uh, fabulous. And so like adult immersion, like to, to really model a program, like it's, it's folks living together for probably like, the, the one among the Salish, I think they do like three months or something like that. But the, the Mohawk one, it's a two year commitment. So like, let's say you were gonna, you wanted to apply and there's a waiting list and there's basically a house, a large house and everybody lives in the house and learns the language together. There are a number of things to sort of consider. Like, I, I think they have a very popular and successful program, but I, I've heard, I think it's a three year commitment. Did I just say two? I think it's a three year commitment. Uh, I do think they they encourage folks who don't have kids to apply, but that's also something that you can sort of figure out. And then the the other thing that we noticed among our language learners with Tlingit is most people who are learning Tlingit, uh, I would say, are probably the only one in their household who are. There are some exceptions where, like, there are partners who are learning together, and that's I think increases the success rate because you just have someone to talk to. Uh, but again, like those are people's personal lives and their decisions. And so some, but basically you gotta be living there full time so that the whole, the language lives in the house. I do think that 
the other thing that's missing is sort of a, an official language place, like somewhere where once you, because the, the language nest and the immersion program can become those so that once you walk through that door, you just got to leave your English outside. And so you, one of the things is you're creating these physical spaces where the language has dominance. And, and so that's a big thing with the nest and that's a big thing with, um, with an immersion program, an adult immersion program. But that means everybody's got to adhere to those rules. And so the parents at our nest were very good. They'd come in and, uh, you know, one of them would speak Juchten and we're like, yeah, that's fine. That's great. Uh, but, you know, nobody was speaking English. So they would ask to meet us outside. So we'd go outside and talk with them if we needed to talk to them in, in English. But when they came in for both drop off and pick up, it was, it was either quiet or they were learning how to say some things in the language. So I, I think these things can, and then there's the master apprentice program. So like, I think having a 30 year vision has to do with like, how do these things exist? How do we possibly do it with limited administrative resources, financial resources? There's, there's not enough land usually for this kind of stuff as well. Uh, and then there's one other thing I wanted to share with you folks from when they sort of kicked off their session in Yakutat, we we just sat down with their speakers and we said, let's think of everything, every phrase that we might want to use to stay in the language. So talk about this more. I know, I don't know. Um, and we just, and some of them, they, they had a lot of fun. Like some of the elders were really laughing as they're thinking of these things. And then, um, also just trying to sort of keep folks, you know, get them to not use English. And we would revisit this list. Like, so basically I would come in four times a year and I'd check out and I'd, I'd do individual one-on-one -on -one language assessments with the apprentices. And then we would sit down as a group and we would go over this list and say, are there any other phrases that we need to sort of help us and they would run into they say oh, i was wishing i knew how to say this or that or because uh, sometimes just going through this list they would brainstorm and and think of things uh, that they wish they knew how to say any other thoughts questions ideas another thing i wanted to add is just the piece about the administrative paperwork i think that that's also a piece where i've been struggling just myself as a language director of balancing out time focused on studying, speaking, you know, work, documenting, working on the language versus how much needs to be spent on administrative tasks, like writing grants, reporting on grants, <laughs> thinking about, you know, things. But I, I, I really think a lot about, you know, kind of trying to strike a balance in there that's a little bit more natural for us as native people, I guess, with our, uh, with an approach. And I like what you just said about maybe dropping in and just speaking with the apprentices, you know, four times a year to check on their progress and their, their development with, you know, the speaking the language and having some kind of an assessment tool um, in, in place, but just minimizing that additional paperwork, I guess, an administrative workload so that more emphasis can be put on the language. It's also something that I've been thinking about. Yeah, and you're going to have to come up with a strategy for that because if, if you're not careful, I think there's a couple things that can happen. One, if someone who's a language learner and user gets pulled out to be the administrator, and then they're so busy keeping the program going that they you lose a you lose a future speaker because they're they're just bogged down in administrative work, and, and someone has to do that work. So then maybe you bring someone in uh, who doesn't know anything about the language, and then you end up with sort of a conflicting ideologies where they say, well, what we really need to do is this. And then they'll sometimes change the whole direction of the program based on their own sort of instincts, especially if they're like a long time educator in, in some other field. Like, so they'll just sometimes say like, well, I know how to be a teacher. So let's just become, let's just be teachers, but we're not being language teachers. And so it'll veer it off into this whole other direction. And, and so finding someone you know, finding that right person to, to be that figure and, and to make it a rewarding job as well, I, I think is tough. It, it's, it's tough to find the right folks who, who could do this stuff, but I do think 
it can happen. And I also think with all these things in place, what with all these different pieces we're talking about, language nest for the babies, a language immersion program for the adults, language classes for everybody, immersion gatherings, which is all, all this should be related. So you should bring all these pockets together during these immersion events, uh, which probably should be, I think, done in probably two simultaneous, like ideally you'd have like these two big rooms. And then one room is conversations. It's the immersion room. In the other room, there's lessons. It's the language learning room. And then there's a third room where everybody gets together and eats. And let people choose which, which space they're going to go into. And then sort of like, because you're going to have to build this whole community. And while you're doing this, you're also going to find a whole bunch of stuff as you make new words, as you document new things to say, is you're going to have to start, I think, running your own dictionary so that you don't have to rely on someone 